So, good evening. It's crowded as usual. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm Fabio Chiusi. I'm freelance journalist and researcher. And uh, my co-panelists here today are Hannes Grasseger from Switzerland, uh, no, from Germany, uh, living in Switzerland, maybe, yes. Economist and journalist, and he delved into this topic. Uh, the topic we're going to talk today uh, is Putin's art of warfare, and uh, information warfare and cyber warfare. And we'll see how the, the terms here are really important and the language we speak is really important to really understand what's going on. And especially after what's happened in these hours, which is kind of interesting too. And um, um, Anas wrote some interesting articles uh, among the first ones to, to, to join in, and, uh, in this discussion and actually describe to the world what was going on, starting from Cambridge Analytica and, the, and all the, the tactics that we've seen deployed after, after that. And uh, we have uh, Andrei Soldato, who's editor-in-chief of Argentura.ru and, and an author of a wonderful book I suggest you to read, The Red Web, about surveillance, digital surveillance in Russia. It's kind of a historical, um, historical analysis and, and both, you know, um, trying to understand what, what's, what's going on on, on mass surveillance in, in Russia. So thanks for that. And we have Galina Timchenko, editor-in-chief of Medusa. It's an outlet, uh, an English, also in English, about uh, speaking, speaking the truth actually to what's going on in, in, in Russia, especially especially important on these uh, topics of uh, digital, digital rights and, and, and digital legislature. And uh, we're going to see it's it's been passed uh, in the last days too. Very important news from Russia there. And I would start like in, uh, going straight into the heart of matters with uh, with Hannes, and I will ask him to actually explain. What was going? What is going on? How did it all build up? And what kind of strategies Putin is deploying and Russia is deploying to to do to accomplish what basically? So um, hello and good evening. Um, so in in mid two thousand sixteen, um, my uh, what sparked my interest in information warfare and um, actually. Um, a Russian um, or potentially Russian um, technologies and ideas used in that field was a totally different um, context. Was a company called Cambridge Analytica, which we started investigating um, uh, early on and uh, actually publishing a report in late 2016. And that company has a background in uh, what what is termed a stratcom or a strategic communication. And uh, they had been uh, active, or their mother company, SCL, had been active um, globally for um, military, in the military context, and uh, visiting um, Eastern European countries. And following up on, on the Cambridge Analytica reporting, I went to uh, Tallinn, where there's a major um, NATO center um, for information warfare. And I started investigating um, what is today called a Web War One. So the 2007 cyber attacks on Estonia. <laughs> um, so um, this was kind of a test case, many people say, for um, cyber warfare, a blueprint as well for what we've seen going on in Georgia in 2008 and Crimea in 2014 and some of the stuff that happened later on in the United States around um, election time and still um, ongoing, things like Black Matters. So what happened in 2007 in Estonia? Um, on, on the evening of April 26, there were uh, demonstrations in, in the town center of Tallinn, which is a quite small um, place, a quite calm city as well, um, that rapidly turned into uh, riots. The, the, the matter of, of the conflict and the demonstrations was um, the plan to remove a bronze uh, statue in the town center of a Red Army war hero. So um, for a, a big part of the ethnic Estonian um, population, that was kind of a symbol of the op occupation um, uh, and integration into the Soviet empire starting in 1944. But for um, 250,000 uh, Russian-speaking um, people, in Estonia, that was um, a, a statue representing the enormous efforts the Red Army had taken to fight uh, fascism. And um, so that was the rift within society. And um, whilst the demonstrations were going on in the city center, 
um, that some people working in information security started to see uh, um, cyber attacks happening. So uh, there was all sorts of um, increasing data traffic flowing in from uh, a vast, um, later to be um, discovered botnet, um, and um, they they experienced like a wide array of different um, weapons being used, such as mail bombing, um, DDoS attacks, defacements of websites, and even war dialing of security and phone numbers used for emergency cases that blocked um, these numbers. Um, so that was um, very hard to see who was actually behind these attacks. So in Estonia, people at the time tried to figure, um, is this kind of centrally um, organized? And um, they, couldn't, they couldn't find any, any sort of smoking gun because the botnet that's what that was being used was uh, globally distributed and dispersed. And there were um, some com computers um, being used um, based in the US. There was something um, even in Moscow. Um, there was all around the world, computers started to attack basically that country. And so within Estonia, um, people were really confused about what was happening. And um, so they had on the streets battles going on, um, not really military battles, but demonstrations. And um, Russian language media and fora, so this is before social media and before, you know, before Facebook, everybody was on Facebook and started using Facebook for such things. Um, there was a lot of hateful and angry messaging uh, against Estonia as a kind of fascist paradise that um, has to be fought. And what is really important, um, I figured after, after looking into these things, that the whole um, attack um, followed a, a kind of a holy trinity um, of um, a, a, um, um, strategies, which is um, the attacks were uh, crowdsourced so people who wanted, um, there, were, there were descriptions um, on the net being uploaded to fora um, for people who had no um, uh, technological understanding of how to do hackings or um, how, to, how to use their um, computers against Estonia, but um, they, were giving, they were being given manuals. And so there was kind of a crowdsourcing of soldiers happening on the net. And on the same time, there were, um, there were contact addresses being given um, where you could actually donate money to um, crowdfund these activities going on against Estonia. So there was crowdsourcing of troops. There was crowdfunding of the activities, such as financing the botnets. This is co costly. And there was an outsourcing of the, activity of the weapons and activities happening. So um, imagine these computers being used um, to attack Estonia, they were not, um, they were not part of a, a pre-formed um, 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 weaponry that was already being set up. This was um, probably your computer um, taking part um, uh, without you even seeing um, that, that you're doing it. And so after three weeks, these attacks just stopped. This was on May 19th in two 2007. And up until today, there is no clear attribution being given. So it's very hard to say this was really a Russian attack. But if you ask anyone in Estonia, he'd probably tell you this is the Russian attack against Estonia. And so um, this, my report is not so much um, the story that I wrote for the New Republic, was not so much about like, um, this is really Putin's uh, big plan, but what is the underlying philosophy and many of you might have heard about the so-called uh, Gerasimov Doctrine, which is not really a doctrine, which was um, a thing he published in a magazine, and probably you guys might know be much better than me about these um, ideas. But um, I stumbled across a certain um, information warfare philosopher called Sergei Rastoguev, a Russian military analyst who, um, in 1998, published a book, Philosophy of Information Warfare. And um, there's a little anecdote that I found kind of striking. And um, the anecdote is about um, a fox that wants to eat a turtle. And that fox um, goes to the turtle and um, offers him money to 
um, get rid of his shield and the turtle understands, oh, this would be a bad idea. Um, but then um, the, the fox um, starts using media. So in that, in that anecdote, the turtle lives in a forest and um, the fox starts um, sending advertisements um, to the TVs that are in this forest where you see a, a lot of happy flying turtles and it's a really funny story, and um, these turtles, of course, they, they don't carry a heavy shield on them. And so uh, one day, um, the turtle goes out of his little um, house, and again, he sees that um, uh, advertisements of, of uh, happy flying turtles, and he uh, decides to lay his shield off. And then, of course, this is his last day. So. Um, what Rastogurf is saying in this, um, in, this little, um, in this little story is that one of the most effective weapons of today's conflicts is, is actually information, or rather disinformation. And um, whilst many people separate between cyber warfare, which is mainly about infrastructure attacks, such as hacking, um, electricity crits, um, and information warfare, which is about a psychological context or social hacks, um, I think the core concept of cyber war can be unified as to say um, this is psychological manipulation of the enemy with both infrastructure um, attacks and social hacks. And they're just meant there to um, increase um, existing rifts within society and make um, a society go against each other um, w in its own, uh, with its own people. So, and the story kind of ends in 2017 in Charlottesville, um, which is in the United States. And again, there's another big dispute about a war hero statue, which is, um, which people are planning to remove. And demonstrations and riots erupt. And what we saw um, through uh, tracking um, um, on, uh, through tracking the tweets that um, pro-Russian accounts were retweeting and pushing, um, the Hamilton 68 tracker it's called, um, we saw that conflicting keywords were being pushed by um, pro-Russian accounts such as Antifa, Trump, but also a Daily Stormer call, uh, story about a right-wing conspiracy theory concerning Heather Heyer, the victim of, of that car attack. and. Um, so whilst I'm not saying that this is a, another case where the same script was uh, being repeated, um, I, I was particularly looking at a guy called Yes, You're Racist. This is a Twitter account, and his mission is to identify and call out uh, right-wingers. So what the guy does is basically he um, crowdsources images from his followers, so he says, sent me in all the photos of the people on the demonstrations from the right-wing side. Then he identifies these persons, he doxes them, and um, once he's got the information, he publishes this on Twitter. So he um, also on Twitter asks for money to crowdfund his activities. So again, he's using the same strategy of crowdfunding, crowdsourcing, and outsourcing because once he's published the identities and the contacts of those uh, right-wing people he uh, identifies as Nazis, he's actually asking others to act upon, and it led to a lot of um, a, a lot of activity against um, right-wingers who were present in that um, during these demonstrations. So I do think we don't need to um, actually discuss. Um, this as a particularly Russian um, style of warfare, but after, after investigating it, I felt that Russia is just a, a great example where we see a lot of those things very clearly. And many other nations are involved in that. And it's in, in its worst case, it's just a strategy, a way of attacking um, others um, with no top control uh, that can be used by basically anyone. So that guy, yes, you're racist, is just an example of actually using very similar strategies and I don't think he has any form of uh, connection to any sort of organized uh, Russian plan. And um, if we look at into the future, I think 
um, there's a massive potential for um, even, even further abuse of, of such disinformation campaigns with uh, massive personalized um, attacks. And we've all heard about Adobe's project where you can do um, photoshopping of videos, and so live photoshopping of that. And that will probably be weaponized much more badly in the future. So that's the report. Thank you. Uh, Thanks so much, Hannes. You want to comment on that? Sure. Yeah, may I give uh, an illustration to your, to your speech? Uh, uh, my colleague mentioned uh, Estonian attack. And um, in fact, there is no clear evidence whether it's Russians, uh, Russians or not. But happily, uh, we have very strong and clear evidence of uh, Russian state companies involved in other attacks. For example, in uh, 2015, we published, we Medusa published a report uh, about uh, one guy who was seeking asylum in Finland. Uh, a year ago, in 2014, he was hired by some company uh, to be beta tester for a super a new uh, technological system, computer system. Uh, he uh, knew for sure that uh, this company was state-owned company Rostech. Uh, they are in charge of all uh, Russian weapons and IT, um, IT technology. So uh, uh, he was beta tester and he tested those systems uh, who provide, uh, provide DDoS attacks on the main sites of foreign states. For example, on his eyes, those guys from Rostech uh, made DDoS attack on the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine site and site was shut down. So we have clear evidence about uh, Russian state companies' involvement in those attacks. Thanks. And what I would like to ask to all of you, but starting from Andre, is is this overall strategy effective? What kind of impact does it have on, on us and on our discourse about these kind of, of issues? Is it affecting our language? Is it affecting the way we portray the word? And are we giving probably Russia too much importance? So. Uh, thank you very much, Fabio. Uh, thank you for having me here. I'm, for me, it's, a, it's my third time in Perugia, and I'm extremely happy to, to get back. Well, first of all, I, I also wanted to get back to this uh, 2007 attack on Estonia, because actually we, we do have uh, a confirmation. We have a statement made by Konstantin Galaskokov. He was one of the uh, political officers of pro-Kremlin uh, youth movement, and he took credit for this thing, uh, and he was interviewed by Financial Times, and uh, his claim was never, well, uh, disputed by his superiors in the Kremlin. So it gives you at least a hint uh, what actually happened uh, in, in Estonia, that some people close to the Kremlin wanted to take credit uh, for this attack. But to uh, answer your question, uh, Fabio, I think we need to try to, and I would try to answer two questions, is uh, when it all started and why uh, it's all started. Actually, we should, if we want to understand the history of this, uh, of this thing, we need to get back to 1999. And Vladimir Putin just became the Russian prime minister, and Russia was in the midst of... Uh, the Second Chechen War. It was a very bloody conflict, uh, not hugely supported by the Russian population. And the Kremlin back then had a problem. And this problem was how to explain to the Russians why second time in five years the Russian troops were sent to Chechnya. He found a way how to deal with the media and we got some, uh, some repressions against media. One of the biggest TV channels was, uh, was uh, silenced and pacified, but he needed to provide a general explanation of what went wrong first time when we got the first Chechen war back in 1995, 1996, and why this time in 1999 it would be, all would be absolutely different. And he found this explanation. He said, basically, that we lost the first Chechen war thanks to journalists. Because Russian journalists and foreign journalists, they undermined the Russian war effort. 
and they pose that very for an information security threat to the Russian Federation. And that was the moment we got this terminology, this language of information threats, information warfare, information security. Uh, a year later, in 2000, Vladimir Putin signed a doctrine of information security. And the idea of this uh, doctrine basically is to say that the Russian population is under threat, under constant threat, posed by media and the new media, the internet, by some actors from outside, and they constantly try to uh, contaminate the Russian information space by some by by by, by false claims uh, or critical stories, and we need to find a way how to deal with that. And that was the moment that uh, when. Vladimir Putin and the Kremlin understood that uh, we, we could pacify the media. It was relatively easy. Uh, you can use all kinds of repressive uh, mechanism, but uh, the internet presents a formidable challenge. Uh, Chechens uh, launched their own websites, and it was well difficult to uh, to take them down because most of them were based out of uh, well outside of the Russian borders. And uh, two years passed, and in 2002, a group of students in Tomsk, in Siberia, they launched an attack on uh, the biggest uh, Chechen separatist website and took it down. And that was the moment when the FSB, the Russian security services, and the Kremlin understood that they, they found this magic trick. They can use outsourcing. They can use some people uh, who are not directly are affiliated with the state, who might be students, might be programming youth movements, uh, might be hackers, might be criminal hackers, but they are not part of the government. And they might be encouraged or sometimes directed to attack the targets which uh, deem it to be dangerous uh, and important for the Kremlin. And then we got the attack on Estonia, and then we got the war in Georgia, and then we got things in Ukraine, and everywhere could, uh, uh, Putin and the Kremlin used, uh, has used these um, this techniques and outsourcing, because that helps you to uh, deny uh, any responsibility. But what happened next, and I think it's really important, is when we are talking about, say, 2016 and the attack on, on the DNC in the United States, or we are thinking about the, uh, the French election and, uh, and, again, hiking attacks, or we are thinking about Brexit, and, again, we are told that we have Russian hackers or Cambridge Analytica. The biggest question here is, of course, the impact, the real effect. Do we really believe that all these hackers or all these trolls or all these bots really uh, changes the picture? And probably, to me, it's a, it's a very big question. Uh, and I think that uh, we need to, uh, to separate two things. We have a very well documented case of the Russian interfering, but we are still uh, very far from understanding the real impact of all these uh, interfering. And we do not know yet uh, how effective this, the, uh, all, these, uh, all these activities was. But we know for sure at least one thing. Uh, for many years, for almost 15 years, uh, there was a dispute between Western cyber experts and Russian cyber uh, experts uh, of the way how to talk about cybersecurity. And for the West, and especially for the British and for the Americans, uh, the way to talk about cyber was always about uh, they, they wanted to use cyber security terminology. And the Russians ins uh, have insisted on talking about information security. And the reason was because we wanted to talk about the content. We wanted to patrol the content. And we wanted to see journalists as information soldiers as we actually started seeing them back in 99 and 2000 because of the war. And the West was not that ready to accept this terminology, probably because they understood that one day or another, if you talk this language, uh, finally you can have your journalist uh, call, it journal uh, call it soldiers. And uh, well, you have RT and Sputnik, Russian propaganda channels, uh, identified as soldiers. And in this case, the Kremlin would say, okay, your CNN and your BBC, your La, La Republica, they're also soldiers. 
So we need to, uh, to find a way how to get rid of them or how to pacify them. But that changed. In 2016, lots of people in the West, they started talking this language. So actually, to me, the Kremlin was successful, at least in one capacity. They found a way how to get us talking the Kremlin's language, the language of threats, of information security, and they basically started treating all of us uh, in this room as soldiers. And as a journalist who've been to some well, uh, wars and I covered some terrorist attacks, I'm just not very comfortable to be treated as a soldier. I think it's a, it's a very big, if not mistake, but it could, la uh, could lead us to a very dangerous situation and probably we, we need to think about it. Thanks so much, Andre. And I, we have a very real impact and very successful one, even if beyond speaking Kremlin language, even when we speak our language, for example, fake news, it's often wise used you know, by authoritarian regimes to actually justify cracking down on free speech. And as Medusa wrote, uh, I think uh, some weeks ago and yesterday, uh, the Duma passed the first version of this law. Uh, there is a new law in Russia coming that would require uh, every social media to establish representation in Russia. It would force every social media company to identify their users by their phone numbers. So uh, effectively giving up anonymity. And especially it will be, uh, it will, they will for, be forced to delete any unverified publicly significant information presented as reliable information. And the article says, in other words, the Russian government could force social networks to remove anything it says is fake news, basically. And um, again, in the same days, we had Telegram blocked. In the past, we had LinkedIn blocked. So I would like to ask Galina Monchenko what, what's going on there and how powerful is our use of language, too, in influencing that. Uh, um, <clears throat> may I say that uh, uh, this situation is very tough but not so, so tough as you think. <laughs> because Russia, a Russian state Duma or Russian parliament, they passes uh, more than 100 mm. laws restricting internet and freedom of press. From the law of protecting children of harmful information yes. to the uh, anti-extremist uh, package Propaganda. of laws, uh, according to this law, every provider should keep all the information, not just meta data, but all the information, including messaging, uh, for three years. So it's just 101st uh, way to cut our heads off. That's all. <laughs> we have 100, and it's 100 at first. Want to comment? Want, want to comment on that? Oh. So, um, so there's there's a law that I read about in Russia. One of those uh, hundred uh, laws that uh, restricts um, buying um, uh, data um, from Russian uh, uh, companies and Russian internet users as a foreign entity. So um, if you want to target somebody with information, you first have to kind of analyze activities, what the in person does online, and that is being restricted, mm. uh, if I understand correctly. Mm. Uh. So uh, what I did on the American side then, I called one of those data brokers to see how bad is the situation really and I was claiming I was kind of a, a, a religious cookbook startup, okay? And I, it's, a, it's a really funny thing. So I called up um, that company and said, could you give me three to nine million uh, female uh, potential customers in the United States? And they said, sure, address and name, no problem. And then I said, it's cookbooks. Can you give me information about what they eat? Of course, we got that information, their shopping behavior, their credit card records. And then I said, um, you know, it's religious cookbooks, so could you, you know, we don't want to hurt our customers' feelings. Could you sort them into religions? And the price for all of that was three cents per unit. Okay, so <laughs> if I want to target uh, some Western population, specifically American, <laughs> I can do so for very cheaply through open markets. 
uh, in Russia you could uh, um, you could maybe buy it on the black market. Uh, <laughs> It seems to me it's the only way because, you know, uh, uh, Andre is uh, absolutely right. It seems to me that their strategy is to make, your, uh, to make you begin fidgeting, to uh, make you be scared or be frightened. Uh, you know, uh, all these laws, um, maybe they passed uh, for good, but it's... Uh, to my point of view, they passed to uh, pick up just one but symbolic victim and to punish it and to make all over uh, all other industry uh, be frightened. That's all. Yeah, you were saying that in Russia, for example, nobody uh, actually uses LinkedIn. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know, yeah. actually, yes, yeah. yes, it's not very popular yeah. source, but you know. Uh, Kremlin has his information strategy and his, he has strategy, internal strategy and external. And external strategy, it's something like, something like to play cards with, uh, um, with not, with dishonest people. <laughs> to play cards with dishonest people. Uh, for example, uh, uh, is there any person who know for sure numbers of audience of Russia today? <laughs> nope. I can say you that Russia today, I, I mean website, is much more smaller than my Medusa. But you are speaking about Russia today. They just won. It's, it's a victory of Kremlin. You have to think about Russia today and Sputnik. I have very good example. I live in Latvia, and uh, Kremlin established uh, Sputnik.lv special branch for Latvia. Nobody read it. Nobody, for sure. It, it was something six hundred persons a day or something like that. Uh, then Latvian government was scared by. Kremlin propaganda, and they blocked and banned Sputnik.lv. Guess. Everybody knows Sputnik.lv. And they gather 10,000 a day. Wow, they do did redirect for Sputnik.com. So Kremlin, Kremlin won one more time. They are playing on our fears. And that's all. Yeah. They're paying effectively, apparently, as we know, we've been speaking about Russian interference in, in, in uh, Western elections like for a, a year and a half, two years now. And the first question will be, um, do you see this as, as a problem as things now stand or in perspective for what it may become? And another question which is related is uh, what kind of interference Putin uh, plays in in social media internally for for Russian election, and what how what happened on social media in the last election too in Russia, and that will be for the Russian guests of course. And to Hannes, I would like to comment on the on the Western interference. So uh, I I think the the thing that the um, Estonia case um, still te tells me up until today is Estonians have this ongoing disinformation thing through all sorts of Russian channels. May it be social media, may it be uh, Russian state-sponsored uh, TV or radio or whatever. So it's now a constant attack on Estonia um, that um, made them build up particular uh, defense forces. Mm. One of them is called Propastop, funnily enough. Um, so Propastop is kind of a anonymous collective of people who constantly look at sto stories that go viral or are potentially going viral um, and try to debunk them if they are um, scare stories. So for example, there was a story, I think in Lithuania, that one NATO um, uh, plane had lost an atomic bomb and that bomb fell into a house. And uh, what happened is that somebody put up a video um, online uh, with a, a woman crying in front of a house that was burning and uh, sent that um, imagery with a comment and a fake, a fake, uh, like a, a, a totally made up 
um, apology, I think, um, featuring U.S. state symbols, um, sent that to several media outlets, uh, hoping that they would pick up on the story. And so Propastop heard about it, and they um, figured through forensic methods that this is kind of a combination of old imageries, mm -hmm. and then they publish this on their website. So um, if people feel insecure about a certain thing, they can go to that website, they can see it on social media. Um, this is kind of a hoax story. So we must get away from this idea that this is only happening during election time. So it's kind of a, a, a constant uh, thing. And if you look at the Black Matters movement in the United States, um, one of the people that I know who helped organize um, Occupy Wall Street, he actually was giving an interview to a so-called Black Matters activist, which turned out to be kind of a, a sponsored yes. pro-Russian uh, group. So, um, and this is, this is like at the, so Black Matters actually had manifestations in the streets, people believing they were kind of fighting for a very different cause. Um, and, and so we have to also see that this is kind of like, it's not a cyber thing. It's not only happening on the internet, it's, it's actually on the streets. And so this, is, this, this coming together is what makes me really think that this terminus information warfare is actually too good not to use it because it's, it's, such, a, it's such a better understanding than the Western concept of cyber warfare, which is only about like electricity grids, you know, <laughs> blocking street lights, like setting the banking system on hold, you know, that kind of stuff. So I wonder what kind of terminology should we use? <laughs> it's, it's very sophisticated. Well, uh, let me start with one thing. Uh, Galina is absolutely right. We have more than 100 laws, but still, Medusa is available in Russia. My website is available in Russia. Navalny is the biggest enemy of Vladimir Putin, the main figure in the Russian opposition. He has his blog available, and he has his channel on YouTube available, and uh, he's uh, hugely popular. So you have this uh, strange contradiction. You have the Kremlin being surprisingly good abroad while well, uh, confusing people, spreading disinformation and propaganda, just what Hannes uh, described. And at the same time, you see that inside the country, he is surprisingly weak. And probably the explanation is that these, uh, these tasks, these objectives are fundamentally different. One thing if you need to confuse everybody. If you do not have one particular idea, like you want to promote Putin as the biggest guy in the country, and you just need to confuse everybody with uh, different, uh, uh, different narratives. Uh, well, the internet was built to spread information, that's fine, so you can also spread this information. And a completely different problem if you want to restrain information. And, well, the Internet is not built to restrain information. And it's a big problem for the Kremlin, and it's, uh, it's became a big problem well, when we got the war with Ukraine. Look, uh, the Kremlin uh, has been trying to, uh, to deny the Russian military presence in Ukraine for years. Officially, there are no Russian soldiers there. But we, so, uh, we journalists, and not only journalists, but the public, in the West and in Russia, we know almost everything about the Russian military presence in Ukraine. We have the number of units, we have the names of the generals, we have people killed, well, or maybe uh, arrested by Ukrainians, we, we know everything about battles. Why? Because Russian soldiers, they love social media, and they love to boast. And they love to picture themselves and then to post these pictures, and they love to provide geolocation of the units. And it's, uh, it's not really easy for the Russian uh, command to, to restrain them from doing this. And the other problem is that uh, Putin slightly changed his um, model of governing, uh, I would say, after the annexation of Crimea. Before that, it was all about passivity. So he wanted to spread this message, forget about politics, uh, forget about, uh, about thinking uh, what's going on uh, in the country and outside, well, just do your business. But after the annexation of Crimea, he decided to mobilize population. And what we got? We got, for instance, in our schools, we got uh, teachers. 
uh, promoting Russian propaganda and giving special lessons and attacking kids for being uh, not sufficiently uh, patriotic. But look, it's not 80s. A lot of his kids, they have a iPhones or smartphones, they started recording these videos and posted them online. And the whole thing backfired on the government. Immediately we got lots of videos on YouTube with uh, screaming teachers uh, saying you are traitor of your country because you support Navalny. And what we got next? We got uh, March of, uh, of the last year, huge protests all over the country. And the biggest question the Kremlin has why on earth we got people in the way teens, people of 17 years old, uh, 16 years old, on the street protesting against the Kremlin? Because of that, because of these videos on YouTube. Uh, so actually the internet as a, as, uh, as a space, as a technology, uh, presents a formidable challenge for, uh, for the regimes uh, which are based on restraining of, uh, of flow of information. They can use this technology to spread disinformation, but they do not know how to control the information. It's really, really difficult. That's, that's a nice understanding of it, thanks. And, uh, and concerning language, we've been, we've been hearing uh, talks of cyber cold war, and that's, that I think it started right after the election, and I think Hillary Clinton mentioned it quite some times, and liberal pundits started accepting this kind of geopolitical frame of the situation that we are in the middle of a cyber cold war, which is something that's turning into actual war, as we've seen in these hours, during these hours. Do you think that this is dangerous? This is, is correct to use such kind of wordings? And asking you and Galina. And well, uh, to be honest, I don't think, I, I think it's quite misleading to yeah. use these kind of terminology, because again, it's a very, it's a very Kremlin way to talk about things. Um, one thing we need to remember is that uh, the Kremlin and Putin personally knows how to exploit confrontation with the West to his benefit. It's all started in 1998, 1999, sorry for this uh, historical lessons. But back then, uh, the Russian government was not really popular. And lots of people, uh, the middle classes, uh, they ob obviously they were quite liberal and it was understandable. And all of a sudden, we got the bombings on Belgrade in 1998. In, uh, and uh, immediately, uh, the Kremlin saw an opportunity that you can use and exploit this feeling that something is wrong and you can send this message to the Russian people, like, well, the West betrayed us. Uh, the, the West was uh, hypocritical all this, uh, all this time. And we saw this, uh, this happening many times. Uh, and uh, for instance, uh, the most spectacular example for me uh, was the war in Georgia in 2008. Everything was already in place, we have our tea, uh, already in operation for two years, so we have all, well, all media under control, most of the media under control. We have the war and Putin as a strong man. And what was really interesting, that the Kremlin decided, and uh, the Kremlin propaganda decided to focus themselves, not on portraying, say, atrocities committed by the Georgian troops. Instead, they decided to uh, spent all, all TV time uh, uh, showing the hypocrisy of the BBC and CNN. And that gave uh, Putin popular support. We saw the same thing happening in 2014 with Ukraine and with Syria. So the problem is when you use this language, it actually it helps Putin. And uh, we saw this uh, just uh, actually, uh, well, uh, during the last election. Nobody expected that Putin would, uh, would be given such enormous support, especially in big towns. Uh, the usual picture is that you have regions voting for Putin and you have Moscow, St. Petersburg, big, big cities uh, being more liberal. This time, for, for some interesting reasons, but we got Moscow voting for Putin. And one of the explanations which is quite popular is that we got it precisely because it coincided well, we can say coincided with the attack on Skripal. Because this attack and the way it was covered by the Western media was played by the Russian propaganda 
uh, in a way, uh, so we are under attack again. The West attacking us, uh, the UK attacking us. We live in a besieged fortress, so we need to uh, to give our support to our to our leader. And we got the result. Putin was not only uh, elected again, but he was given with enormous support in, in big cities. Um, I want to mention Andre's word about soldiers. You know, I can see uh, th this threat uh, um, uh, in in this word, uh, soldiers. Uh, you know, uh, yesterday, a uh, special commission of upper house of Russian parliament, uh, they published a list of um, uh, media uh, who is operating in uh, enemy's interest. Medusa is among, and BBC, and Deutsche Welle, my congratulations, it's great co company of friends, it's okay. So they, they already considered us as an enemy, as a soldier of enemy uh, army. But they are at war, and they make some kind of diversions. Uh, you know, uh, they, it, seems, it seems to me that the main threat now is not a uh, so-called cyber war, war, information war, but some kind of time bomb that will be exploded in next maybe five years. Because you know, Russia today, Sputnik and so on, they have no such a big audience, but they have enormous amount of money. And they are hiring young journalists inside Western and Eastern Europe. And they teach them, and they pay them very high uh, salaries. So you have time bomb inside your journalistic society. Sorry. Um, so, so um, initially, when I started the reporting um, on my piece, uh, I was uh, I was not a fan of that narrative, the uh, the all genius Putin mastermind of everything, who kind of understands how to totally because I'm seeing somebody who's not not perfectly well in in running the a country, you know, his own country. So I, I doubt that he's such a genius to, to kind of disorganize the rest of the world so easily. And so what I understand also by looking at the case of the Internet Research Agency, which is the troll factory, as we call it, um, um, it is not owned by Putin, um, just by somebody loyal to Putin, and uh, the activities might not even be sponsored by the Kremlin, but it might be some activity that is just done uh, to please Putin. So what I understand also from reading Pomeranz, Peter Pomerantsev's work is that um, there's this general idea of what kind of pleases the, the, the Putin interest, and a lot of people in your country that want to please Putin uh, are entertaining such information warfare attacks or, or, or things just in order to kind of like be loyal and that's something that would really interest me from your side maybe maybe Is not centrally pleased. planned or organized maybe not or pleased not? but say thank you it's a way to appreciate putin because all the owners of these troll factories they became oligarchs and very rich men during putin reign so it's a way to say Thank you, Mr. President, for our billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. That's all. I would add that uh, probably we need to remember that it's, uh, it started some years ago. Uh, so maybe I would say that, say, seven years ago, uh, the picture you described it was quite correct. But even then, I think it's, it was already used by, by Putin's supporters as a way to... Um, actually, to, uh, as, a, as a way of excuse, say you have a journalist, Anna Politkovska, killed on the, on the Moscow streets. And the explanation is, well, you have some people, maybe they wanted to please Putin, and of course Putin didn't know anything about it. Then you have another guy, Boris Nemtsov, killed, and again you have the same explanation. No, 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 of course Putin and his crowd, they know nothing about this. It's, some, it's about somebody who wanted to please him, and probably he made a mistake. Well, there's some problems with his logic. First of all, nobody was, uh, uh, was punished for this mistake. 
and uh, we, we still uh, we don't know, for instance, uh, who was the mastermind behind the killing of Anna Politkovska, and, he, and she was killed in 2006. We, we don't know uh, who was the mastermind and why, actually. So we do not know the motivation why Boris Nemtsov was killed. And again, it was uh, some years ago. And we have, uh, we have, have Trolls Factory. It started in 2014, uh, and if we have this uh, theory that it was started as a, uh, some sort of effort to please him, well, we have four years in operation and they're still trying to please him and he still doesn't know anything about it. So to me, it's, it looks really, really strange. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, two, two and a half years ago, Putin slightly, or maybe not really slightly, changed his way of uh, governing the country. Uh, now we see much more uh, micro-management than it used to be. And now Putin is personally involved in, in, in decision-making process in many levels. Uh, and that's why we got these selective repressions. And you can see his, um, he, he has a say in many of his cases, from the case of a uh, theater director who is in jail from the case, uh, to the case of, uh, of a minister uh, who is also in jail. So I think that maybe this scheme was quite correct back in the beginning of the thousands, but it's certainly not the case now. So he's that genius. No, he's not genius because he made lots of mistakes. Uh, when we have this story about Russian trolls, uh, remember they made lots of mistakes. For in, just to give you one example, uh, we got trolls uh, already in 2006, 2007, and back then it was about Live Journal. It was a, the most popular uh, platform for bloggers in Russia, and it was really um, very convenient for, uh, for trolls because you might post uh, things anonymously and trolls were there for years and when we got the protest in 2011 and uh, all of a sudden uh, trolls understood that uh, all liberal intelligentsia, all the Russian elites, all Moscow journalists, they already moved to Facebook. They forgot about Live Journal. so you have trolls while doing things on Live Journal on the platform that everybody forgot about so you, and you have the protests in, the, in Moscow streets and you need to do something very quickly about it. And nobody has a clue what to do with Facebook. And I remember uh, a statement made by uh, Deputy Director of the FSB, Sergei Smirnov. He said it with, with very openly. Uh, he was asked by Putin at one of the meetings uh, what we can do with social media. And he said, we're clueless. We do not know what to do. That's why uh, when we got this protest in 2011 and 2012, uh, Pavel Durov, uh, back when he was uh, a CEO of Kontakte, and Kontakte uh, was uh, and still is uh, the biggest and the most popular social media, he was asked to take down some protest groups by fax. He was, a saint, he was sent a fax message from the local office of the FSB. <laughs> it tells you something about uh, well, the competence of these guys. <laughs> it was not that competent. Uh, competent. Yeah, is there an elephant in the room like surveillance, like mass surveillance? I don't know. I, has it changed at all in the last years? Because from what I remember when we last speak, when we last spoke in, in Perugia here, we, we were talking about this storm free, like this mass surveillance instrument uh, that Russia was devising and, and it's been developed for a decade or something. And it was like a kind of, you know, response to what, whatever Snowden was talking about like back then. How, has it changed this thing? Did, did they make better use of it? Or. What? Okay, so uh, very, uh, very briefly, uh, sometimes paranoia is a good thing. Yeah. Uh, so the Russian security services, uh, they are famously paranoid. And uh, at the same time, they have this technical, technological challenge how to introduce mass surveillance given the fact that we didn't have uh, technology. So. The, the idea was, and it was really popular in 2015, 2016, and almost to, and in the beginning of uh, 2017, uh, was to invite Chinese. And Chinese were really happy to help. 
And uh, if you go to uh, information to any information security conference in Moscow, you can see Chinese and uh, Huawei, the biggest Chinese company, telecommunication company, was always present where they, where, 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 where they given money and they invited Russian generals to China. So it was a big thing for China to, to get into this market. And we actually we were happy to provide technologies for uh, data storage facilities and for mass surveillance. And then something happened. All these efforts just stalled. And I was told by many sources uh, that actually what happened is the FSB got paranoid. They decided that the Chinese can use this opportunity as a way to start spying on Russian telecommunications. <laughs> Amazing. So they just killed this thing. Amazing. So thanks to paranoia of the FSB, we do not have a real mass surveillance in Russia. That's amazing. We should apply it all over the world. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would like to open up to questions from the audience, if there are any. Uh, one there, please. Um, I have a question about, uh, you know, uh, regarding the war on uh, information, uh, specifically um, meddling with the foreign uh, elections. So there was uh, an interesting uh, interview with a former CIA director uh, on Fox News, um, named uh, James Woolsey in mid-February, I think. They were talking about the Russian uh, interference in the US elections, and the interviewer asked uh, Mr. James if the US ever tried to meddle with uh, foreign elections. And the interesting thing is that, um, in a very ironic way, he said, uh, well, possibly, but, quote, for a very good cause to stop uh, communism spreading, for example, in the year 47, 48, 49, you know, Italy, France, uh, Greece, etc. And the interesting, another interesting thing is that, uh, you know, we got uh, uh, quite a very good amount of... Uh, scandals uh, about the NSA spying on basically uh, US uh, citizens uh, and uh, recently about Mark Zuckerberg you know using like this all uh, very gigantic amount of metadata you know to uh, I think to impose like some kind of psychological uh, I don't know war on information you know so don't you think that this kind of uh, problem this kind of new warfare is uh, 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 a problem that all uh, really the superpowers have and not only Russia, you know? All can, the kind of, you know, big superpowers like military speaking, economically speaking, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Anish, want to answer it? Yeah, sure. So um, there's this interesting, <coughs> there's this, um, interesting um, different language about the uh, Arab Spring, which in the Russian context often is referred to as the color revolutions. So um, the idea in the Russian uh, language zone, as far as I understand, is that the color revolutions were such a Western influence operation in, in North Africa. And uh, it was kind of an example of what would soon probably be happening to Russia. And from that pa paranoid perspective, um, people in, within Russia started to kind of develop tools or think about um, how to defend against such influence operations through social media. And, um, you know, um, I think what is really interesting for, for us as probably non-state actors, but just normal people, is that we have to understand that they, these all these parties are constantly developing and working on tools um, which are basically playing out in our lives. And that's, that's the real threat. This is why I was mentioning this, this, this uh, guy called, yes, you're racist, even though I totally support the idea of going against Nazism, of course, um, to use uh, these like weaponry that was developed beforehand like doxing, you know, crowdfunding on Patriot, on Patreon, how to how to fight the Nazis, you know, this is kind of a a spread of kind of like in the worst case like a civil war thing, okay, 
and that's um, that's the worst scenario I'm seeing. So it's not really about like the day start or the day start. That's not really interesting. What is interesting is which tools are out there, and and w what are they doing to our lives? I feel. I don't know. Um, well, basically, I think that, of course, uh, the history of uh, of meddling in political affairs of uh, of other countries uh, didn't start in 2016. It's uh, it's kind of obvious. Uh, but I I would stress just two things. Uh, first, uh, it's um, it's really dangerous to try to treat every every con uh, conflict and every uh, revolution if we are talking about the Arab Spring, as uh, a sign of, uh, uh, of some conspiracy, uh, because it could mislead everybody. Just uh, two weeks before the, the, the presidential election in Russia, I was in a meeting with some high-placed uh, Kremlin officials, and they asked me, anxiously, could we expect and should we expect an American attack on uh, on the Russian election because for them it looks very clear. They believe that the CIA uh, well uh, help it to spread uh, the Russian protest in 2011, 2012. Then we retaliated with the Russians. We retaliated. We f we fought back in 2016. So now it's time for the United States to strike back. And it's it just it's 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 not a real world. It's it's a completely different reality. And the other thing is, um, look, there is a big difference between authoritarian countries and, uh, and democratic countries. Sometimes uh, this point is missing. And the difference is the media. Uh, we know about, uh, about all the mistakes and crimes committed by Western security and intelligence agencies, not because of RT or Sputnik, but because of journalists who lived in these countries because of the New York Times, of the Washington Post, of, uh, of uh, the Intercept, of WikiLeaks, of many, many, many media or, or media outlets, and, because, and they are based in these countries. But with Russia, it's a bit, uh, and with the countries like China or Saudi Arabia or Iran, it's a bit different. Probably we need to remember this difference. Uh, may I add that uh, this uh, logic sounds very strange for me. It's some kind of Putin's logic, because when Kremlin uh, see any different situation, he could not characterize as good situation for him. They say, oh, it's Western interference. And uh, when we think about interference in the uh, American election process or any other process, you will mirror. You are mirroring Putin's logic. Ah, we do not like Donald Trump. Oh, I blame Putin. It's a, okay. He is a big target. Uh, do I think that Kremlin tried to interfere? Yes. Uh, but uh, do I believe that Kremlin pick up or elect Trump? No. I'm sorry. <laughs> More questions. One in front here, or and and one there in the back. But we can start there, and then yeah, it's okay. Whatever. Thank. You. Okay. Um, I would like to come back to the title of the workshop. My question is very simple: What does really Putin wants from Europe, or his oligarchs want from Europe? Thank you. Should we get all the two of them, and then get the replies? Thanks. We see a terrible, we see a terrible crackdown on media in many countries. I mean, the developments in Egypt are extreme. Turkey, in China, it was always the case. In Russia, it seems to be less bad than we thought. But uh, where do you see this going? Two clear questions. One to answer. Us. Okay, let's, let's start. Okay. Yeah, we can start. So, what Putin wants from from Europe? Um, look, one of uh, the explanations why Putin is so popular in Russia, given that there should be, the people should be tired of him, like after 18 years, uh, is um, that it looks like there is no, 
no one else. And uh, so you just uh, meet someone on the street, you ask this question, and the, que and the answer would be, who else? We know only Putin. All other guys are insignificant, they have no political experience, and so on and so forth. And why we have this answer? The answer is, uh, we got this answer because of a deliberate uh, Putin strategy to kill trust in all institutions we have in our country. Uh, ordinary Russians, they do not trust their political parties, they do not trust their trade unions, it's a joke. They do not trust their businessmen, they do not trust their officials, they do not trust anybody, and that means that you have a void in a society. You have only one guy, a strong leader, that's all. And uh, for Putin to spread this, uh, to spread this um, climate of complete mistrust in institutions, in all kinds of institutions, including media and journalists, because all of them are compromised in Russia. And uh, the Kremlin made a special effort in the beginning of 2000s to compromise journalists. We got TV series in 2002, 2005, and then you have a good guy, a policeman with a small salary investigating a, uh, an assassination of a corrupted journalist. It's, it was a very popular thing. Uh, and uh, finally, the, well, our audience got a message. Uh, when I was a really young journalist, 1996, that was my first year in my newspaper, I was 20 years old. When I walked into a room and I would say, I'm a journalist, people would say, oh, wow, that's something. Ten years later, 2006, I walk in a room with, uh, with strangers and I say, I'm a journalist. The, the, usual, uh, the usual, well, greetings was, oh, you're a journalist, can I give you $200 and you would write about my company? So... The, the media were completely compromised. Uh, and, and as I said, the same happened to trade unions and political parties. And when you have this void, uh, it's, it makes things much easier for a strong leader because he's the only one. And for, for Putin, it was, as I said, was extremely, uh, extremely useful. And that's why he's still popular. But also, of course, for him, it would be much easier to deal with strong leaders in, in Europe, to get back to, to the sources, to, to, to deal with Metaxa, Mussolini, Franco, and, and Hitler, to have these guys to talk to, and not to think about their parliaments. Remember one thing, uh, when uh, Trump was sort of stopped by the Congress, the Russian Prime Minister Medvedev uh, posted an angry tweet saying, that actually he accused Trump to be really weak. He accused him of being a very weak and, and stupid president out of desperation because for the Russian politicians and for people uh, uh, of the Putin circle, uh, they do not understand, they already forgot this feeling that institutions like the parliament could matter, that the Congress could prevent Trump from doing something because we do not see these things in Russia. And of course we would like to replicate the same system in all countries in the world because that would make things really easy for them. Yeah. Hannes? And, um, and also the media pluralism and, yeah. and freedom. Speaking about media freedom or uh, you know, uh, where is going uh, <clears throat> to the end? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, what can I say? Uh, the, main, uh, the main thought of Putin's regime uh, concerning media is there is no truth at all. Here in Perugia, uh, I, I've heard many times we are seeking for truth. We want truth. Our audience is waiting for truth. And the main thought of Kremlin's so-called journalists or propagandists, there is no truth at all. Everyone has his own truth. So my truth is your lie and vice versa. So uh, Putin wants absolute power. So, and for sure, uh, he will continue uh, to fight with us as an enemy um, and Unfortunately, I'm pessimistic. I do not want to end this discussion with such pessimistic point of view. Sorry. Yeah. And um, I think this erosion of trust is really what is underlying 
everything that people saw happening in Estonia in 2007. So to see all of a sudden that your uh, your 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 ATM is not giving you any money anymore, that your news website is down, that um, actually the supermarket uh, can't can't open the can open the doors because the electronic system is is locked and and at the same time seeing all these like weird messages circulating online which was on on the russian forum which were also being posted on those uh, news websites that were still up um this creates a a, a climate of, uh, of uncertainty actually of people losing trust in their state's ability to maintain order and um so i think you know, given that you mentioned that we know very little how effective these measures really are in terms of numbers and statistics, how much trust is actually being eroded. I still find it kind of logical that journalists who are about like uh, trust and the search for, for truth and, and, and that th we are currently very concerned about this even more than we should probably given the proportional impact such measure, measures might have, you know? It's, 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 it's the right time to think about tools because the society in Russia, you know, I, I, I think I would love to go there and, and see a free and open society because I think it's a great country full of nice people probably, but it's the government is probably messing it up. And so it's right if we're, if we're uh, thinking about these things here as journalists. And that to me is actually a, 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 a real cause for optimism if we are talking about all these automated trust and verification tools about fake news initiatives and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Very last question, because we have five minutes. Ah, thank you. Uh, I often ask people <coughs> about what they think about Putin. And very often they would say that he is a strong man, he is a strong leader. It's, I'm Russian. For me, it's very surprising to hear that because he is a really <coughs> weak man and he is a weak leader. Why? Uh, for example, uh, during elections this year, he won with 76, alleged 76%. Uh, never, he never appeared on any debate with any other candidate. Would any strong leader who respect himself, who respect his country, who respect anybody do like that? I doubt. I think that there is so much lie about Russia in the world, so much lie about Russia in Russian media, in uh, world media. There are no elections in Russia at all, at least since 1996, when Communist leader Zuganov won, but people were said that it was Yeltsin who won. These days, a lot of people know that, and uh, Zuganov explains that that he agreed to say that he didn't win the elections, not to have civil war. I guess that's lie, but at at any way, the greatest lie was when people were said that um, that uh, Yeltsin won. Another lie is uh, happened in, I guess, 19, uh, 1991, when 75 percent of Russian po population on um, national referendum claimed that they want to keep the USSR. Uh, a little bit later, leaders of only three of 15th Republic gathered together and decided that they want the USSR not to exist. It was completely illegal. And now we live in completely illegal country. Now, 1993, bloody coup d'etat committed with participation of American snipers who shoot from the roof of American embassy. My question is, when we stop lying about Russian history, when we start talking about what's really going on in Russia today, because today, let me, give me just one minute, it's really We important. have three, so you have 20 seconds. <laughs> Sorry, it's just, otherwise we cannot answer you to your question. Don't interrupt me then, please. Uh, uh, I mean, today in Russia, the major problem is that real patriots are not only in prison, but not are allowed to be spoken about by 
all media, by Russian and foreign. Mm. Uh, for example, Svetlana Ladarus ran for presidency in 2012, and Russian media would name her a president on the P letter. Uh, there are people whose names are not allowed to be uh, named on Russian media. And okay. I bet nobody knows Nobody of you knows of real patriots, and I actually think that it's uh, the main thing which the West may do for Russia today is to be interested about people who are not allowed to be spoken on any media. Yeah, you want to? Anybody want to comment on this? Well, I can uh, say one thing that uh, at least there should be something positive. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so the only positive thought that after 2016, Putin actually got everybody thinking of, of Russia. So we got uh, lots of people now in the United States and in Europe, and, and Europe uh, actually studying Russian. And we didn't see this for, say, 25 years probably. So now, well, finally people got interested in what's going on in Russia, uh, which is the only uh, positive outcome I, I could think of. <laughs> It seems to me we, uh, we surprised Russia, surprised the West 10th time uh, last century. Let's hope that we could surprise you this century as well. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs> We're running out of time. Bye.